We're here today with Dr. Adrian Rain, the author of the book The Anatomy of Violence and a PIC professor at the University of Pennsylvania. So, uh, Dr. Rain, can you really tell if someone will be a violent criminal just by looking at their brain scans? It's not perfect prediction by any means, but yet we're getting some information, added value over social and behavioral predictors about who's going to become a violent offender whether it's poor functioning in the frontal region of the brain or a low resting heart rate, or the fact that they had birth complications early in life, which damaged the brain or the mother smoked or drank during pregnancy. These are all factors, biological factors, that are combining with social factors to give us a better understanding of the causes of crime. And once we can understand the early factors that go to shape violence and crime, we are going to be in a much better position to be able to predict it in the future. And brain imaging research is right now giving us information, again, over and above the usual predictors of which individuals are going to commit a violent offense in the next three to four years. So you could look at a number of statistics about an individual and say, well, they are more likely to commit crime than someone else. What does that mean? What should we do with that information then? Well, it's never going to be perfect prediction, but nevertheless, today, every day, we make decisions on which prisons to let out of prison. Or an offender, do we put them into prison or do we give them community service? We need to assess their dangerousness levels. And right now we do it on the basis of just demographic and social factors, like are they male? How old are they? What's their employment record like? But now we're finding that individuals with a reduced volume of the amygdala, the emotion region of the brain, those individuals are going to be four times more likely to commit a violent act in the next three years. And that's taking into account their prior behavior and their demographic information. So we're getting added value in terms of prediction. And given we have to make the judgments every day, why not add in extra information if our decision making is going to be better? That's what I try and argue for in the anatomy of violence, a better understanding of the causes of, the, of crime better prediction, and ultimately new intervention and prevention programs. Can anyone then be blamed for doing something wrong, or can you say, hey, it's just how his brain is now? This is a fascinating question, that if a young baby had predispositions, genetic, biological, and social, beyond their control, and yes, they grow up to become a violent criminal offender, you know, do we lock them up and throw away the key? Do we flick the switch on that electric chair? Um, to what extent do we hold them responsible? To what extent do we punish them? Compared to an individual who never had any of those early risk factors that constrained their freedom of will early on in life, and they instead just chose to commit evil. So let's assume that there is free will. Then I would say some people do not have as much free will as others, and that it's shades of gray. It's a dimension, it's a continuum. It's not black and white. And it's not innocence and guilt. It's shades of gray and a dimension like height and weight. There's de degrees of responsibility, degrees of free will. And I think we increasingly need to take this into account in the judicial system in the United States in the future. Uh, would there ever be a time where we should imprison somebody before they commit a crime, just because they look so likely to commit a crime in the future? The minority report, stopping crime before it starts, the preemptive strike. That's what I think a lot of people are very concerned about. So for example, we're talking about, let's take an individual with low resting heart rate, who, someone with birth complications, poor nutrition, all factors that we know predispose to violence. And they have a brain scan that looks like a serial killer. They haven't committed a crime yet, do we lock them up? I'm that person. I have all those risk factors. So I have a great concern in the future about the preemptive strike, about assessing everyone in society to see who's got all the boxes checked, because I would be one of the first people to be rounded up and locked up in prison on indefinite detention. That's one side of the coin. The other side of the coin is that with increasing knowledge and science over time and over the decades, we will, we will get into a better position of predicting who is going to be at risk to society. 
And if we want to protect society, if we want to protect people and children and women in society as well as men, do we need to act earlier than we're acting now? That's the neuroethical dilemma that I think we're going to be faced with in a not too distant future. Right. Now, uh, your work is uh, informed by a lot of dis different disciplines. In fact, you have uh, assignments in three different departments in two different schools at Penn, uh, in the School of Arts and Sciences and also in the Med School at Penn. How do those, what are those three different departments and how do they inform your research? It's been fascinating being at Penn, being in three different departments there that really richly inform my research and my knowledge and my students too. So I'm in criminology. And what that department is teaching me is don't forget the social environment. The social environment is critical. Like neglect early on, like child abuse early on, bad neighborhoods, even the stress of an urban way of life. That can impair the brain in a way to lead on to crime and violence. So don't forget the social part of the equation is what I get from criminology. From psychology and neuroscience, I get the new tools and techniques, brain imaging, molecular genetics, to be able to pry into the criminal brain really for the first time. You know, it's only recently, in recent decades, we've been able to look into the minds of murderers. And through neuroscience, social neuroscience in psychology, I'm getting that leverage. And in psychiatry here at Penn, we had Tim Beck who developed cognitive behavior therapy. So what we've been doing recently is a study which combines cognitive behavior therapy, which has come out of psychiatry here at Penn, and put it together with a nutritional approach to improving the brain in order to reduce aggression and antisocial behavior in children. So those are the three different approaches that I found invaluable in being here at Penn and being a PIC professor. Uh, what is it like for you to combine all of those? To me, the violent offender is like a jigsaw puzzle. So, you know, there's not one cause to crime. For decades, we've been turning over the social pieces of the jigsaw puzzle, like bad parenting, bad homes, bad neighborhoods, racial discrimination. Important social pieces, right? Now what we've been doing through social neuroscience and what I call neurocriminology is uncovering the biological pieces, high testosterone, low heart rates, birth complications which damage the brain, poor frontal lobe functioning, and a, a certain genotype. These are the biological pieces. Now what we've got to do is put these pieces together to see how the biological pieces interact with the social pieces to create the violent offender. Once we can see the violent offender's face in his true colors, it's then that we'll be able to stop the rot. It's then that we'll be able to intervene with the right people in the right way. So it's uh, only by combining all of these disciplines that you're able to have this full picture. Is that right? It's a mosaic. It's like a jigsaw puzzle. It's like you need every piece on this chessboard to play the game. And the same is true in the game of solving crime and violence. We need all the pieces together. We need all the chess pieces. We need all the spaces on the table to place the pieces, play the game, see how those pieces interact and form to create the causes of crime and violence, it's indispensable. The overall gestalt, the overall picture.